Hi, everybody. I'm Hello. Steve Zaharakis, as you just heard. Uh, it's interesting. Lehigh's actually a pivotal, plays a pivotal, pivotal role in my life. As I was walking down this hall again, I heard a bunch of different languages. I looked at the people, and I thought, nah, I could relate. I've been here, kind of done some of that. So today we're going to talk about an interesting topic, ignorance. And in the definition of ignorance, what's ignorance? To ignore, to not pay attention, to not understand, to not value something. Well, they say that ignorance is bliss. And ignorance can be bliss. For example, I bought my son a puppy, not knowing how difficult it was. But how many things do we do that we are able to do because of ignorance? If we knew the problems of raising a family, of being married, of starting a company, if the discoverers relied on what everyone said and didn't disregard them, would we even have explorers? Would we have invention? No. Entrepreneurship by itself doesn't exist if you're looking at something that is guaranteed and if you agree with what everybody else says. So that's the positive side, but there's also a negative side. So today, we'll explore this a little bit, and I'll take you on a brief journey. My journey starts in 1930. Oh, wait. We've got a gift. So this is the negative part. The negative part is how, um, what the scriptures have been written about having a talent and not using it. Having a gift and not appreciating it. How would we feel if we had something that was a present and we didn't know its value? Like a grandparent, like a love, like a friendship, like a relationship. And not knowing how to appreciate that until it was too late, until it was gone. So we're gonna take a brief, a brief journey here and I'll start back with my dad. My father was born in 1930 in Athens, Greece. He was the youngest of three siblings. He was the only boy, and my grandfather would spoil him. He wouldn't come down to eat unless my grandfather would give him pennies. That all changed in World War II. During the German occupation, hundreds of thousands of Athenians died of starvation. Both my grandparents died of starvation. My father's appreciation for food dramatically changed. Around the same period, my grandma, my mother, was one of ten siblings. She loved school. She was bright. Everything was great. But her mother wanted her to stay home and help her raise the children and do chores. My mother was forced not to go to school. All kids at school went to school. They didn't really appreciate it. My mother was deprived. All of a sudden, education was something that she valued. She could understand the value of education. So food, education. My parents actually met in Sydney, Australia. I'm My parents met in Sydney, Australia. To them, they left a depressed Greece and came to a world of opportunity. A wealthy land where there are a lot of options, a lot of things that they could do. They wanted to raise a family. And and we wanted to have a future. So I was born in Redfern, which is a suburb of Sydney. I went to high school in Rockdale, and I played football and cricket and rugby. So <clears throat> the bus would take us on our away tours, on our away games, and also we had TVs at school, which is really an interesting thing. So um, just in case you're looking at who the guy was, that's me there. <laughs> so one of the programs that we saw on TV was the Apollo 11 lunar land. So all of a sudden, you know, we were like blown away. Hey, we could actually go to the moon. 
So we could be a scientist, an astronaut, an engineer, anything we wanted. The land was wide open, our opportunities were there, everyone was encouraging us to succeed, and that was in the 70s. My parents felt homesick for Greece. So in, in the 70s, we left Australia and we went to Greece. Greece is a beautiful European country, but it's not a wealthy one. Not compared to Australia, not compared to America. I was a little bit different. I was there talking, I went to Yota Alpha, the 11th uh, high school of Athens, and um, my, my fellow students thought to me, Steve, you know, you're a little strange here. You're talking about things that we don't really talk about. And grow up, this isn't Australia. This is Greece. We don't actually make things here. And that really kind of struck me. And the way it struck me is the majority of countries around the world don't make cars. They don't make electronics. They don't do research. They don't research pharmaceuticals. There's no genetic testing. There are very few places in the world that have astronauts. Imagine if you live in a country like that. What is your future going to be? What can you do? One of the things that happens is we start thinking that we can't do something. And that's what everything's prefaced by. We can't make cars. We're too small. We can't do research. We're too small. What are we going to do? What kind of future could you have? The future in Greece, there are limited universities and colleges, and everyone wants to get into it. I applied, I didn't get into it. Friends of mine did apply, and they got into it. So I didn't really know, what would my future be? I saw my, future, my friends that actually graduated with an engineering degree. Their first job was pizza delivery food delivery, flowers, driving a taxi. Now you have engineers, accountants, lawyers doing these fields. It's sad, but it's so true. And this, it doesn't just happen in Greece. If you look at the reality of things, it happens around the world. Slowly the we can, we can't affects us and what ends up happening is we feel like I can't. So instead of enabling people to do things, it prevents people from doing things. We know that the economy in Greece has gone very bad. But still, if you look at the data here from the IMF, um, the per capita nominal GDP, Greece ranks 38th in the world. There are hundreds of countries worse off. If that's how it is in Greece, imagine other countries. That summer, an uncle of mine came and visited from America. And it was interesting to see him. What came to heart right off the bat was he had a can-do attitude. He was an engineer and he actually went here to Lehigh. I spoke with him. We spoke about my future. He said, hey, do you, you really want to be an engineer? I said, yes. He says, come visit us. Live with us in America. Go to Lehigh. My parents, I was lucky, my parents could afford it. They sent me here. So I actually came. It was inevitable. I was going to be an immigrant. Talking about immigration and immigrants. What immigrants do, what I did, and the majority of immigrants do, they have a mission statement. At night, when you're here, you're lying in bed, looking at the ceiling, and your thought is, am I better off today than it was yesterday? <coughs> and if not, why am I here? Why have I left everything? Why have I sacrificed? The, um, the place I went to study is right outside these doors. Though some of you have actually come through. You can see this door coming in as you're entering this hall. It's Lehigh University. I actually came to Lehigh, and I wasn't the smartest. I knew I was, though, not to be in college. I knew how my future would be. So I was one of the most determined. 
That's a picture of my Uncle Gus. I ended up getting a bachelor's in electrical engineering, a bachelor's in computer science, a minor in international relations. I went to Drexel to get my master's in electrical engineering with robotics and AI, came back to Lehigh for my PhD in computer science. All about dissertation. <laughs> Growing up, I was asked, what do I want to be when I grow up? I always had one answer. Happy. I don't care about titles. I care about how I feel. I care about what I can do. I stayed in America. I started the company. I have a beautiful wife and three children. My eldest wants to be an engineer. My daughter would like to be a school teacher. My son would like to be a gym teacher. Everything's great. The big thing is that I know myself I have a global perspective. I wanted to share that global perspective with my family. So every year we, we go and visit different countries because we aren't citizens of this little area. We're citizens of the world. And we can affect the world. You can't appreciate something unless you see the opposite, unless you see lack of. You can't really appreciate freedom until you understand the pressure. You can't really stand opportunity until you see despair. You can't see optimism unless you've known pessimism and depression. Everything grows in a nurturing environment. But that doesn't suffice. Just having it around you isn't enough. What you need is you need to be able to be, to have a can-do attitude and to have the confidence that you can actually affect the world. We take that for granted. We hear that all the time. But you know, the majority of the world has the exact opposite. They feel they cannot do. They cannot affect the world. There are very places where the people Feel like they have that power. When I hear people talking about the American dream and they refer to buying a house, are you serious? To me, that's short sighted. What I think is the American dream is the fact that the youth can actually have a dream. That you can dream of a better future. That you can dream of a better reality. And guess what? You have a chance of succeeding. The fact that this country, as a cornerstone, has life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the politicians even thought, even said, or are concerned with, not just the rich and the well-off, but giving opportunity to everybody. When we talk about the Statue of Liberty, coming through there, I don't know, as an immigrant, I don't know how everybody else feels, but it really is the place where dreams do come true. And it does shine the light on the Golden Gate. And it asks for the poor, those yearning for freedom, and to breathe fresh air, free air, and to work hard and to succeed. That's who we're looking for. Americans, we see these two glasses. And half of you are thinking, the glass is half full. The other half, it's half empty. To the world? America's cup runneth over. My father died. Um, he loved being able to feed people and enjoyed having friends and family over and giving them food. You can understand how he relates to that. But don't let a tragic event make you appreciate what you have. What we have here in America are the opportunities that most of the world never dreamt of. If Syrian refugees kill themselves to go to Greece, what do you think the world would do to come to America? For me, the worst thing that I can see is people not appreciating what exists here. What people have died to provide for the rest of us. What most people here have. So, I'd like to conclude with this. I'd like everyone to maximize their opportunities. Appreciate what you have. Seize the moment of the deal.